Welcome, everyone. Today's webinar is entitled, The Value of Genome Sequencing. Thank you for joining us. Today, I'm Monica Wellner. I am a manager at Seattle Children's Hospital and Operation Director, Director of the PLUGS program. I'm thrilled to be on site at Prevention Genetics in Wisconsin, my home state, where we will be broadcasting live with our presenter, Dr. James Weber, the Founder, President, and Chief Executive Officer at Prevention Genetics. Today we will cover applications of genome sequencing and the importance of early and accurate diagnosis. We will compare different genome sequencing test methodologies and gain a better understanding of the current limitations. We will then evaluate and discuss the value and predicted future state of genome sequencing. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge our partner, Medical Training Solutions. As a reminder, today's program is accredited for PACE credit through MTS. If you have any questions about PACE, please contact Megan Hinch. Please note that today we will not be taking the phone, but if you would like to ask a question, please submit it via the question and answer dialog box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You can ask a question at any time during the event. However, questions will not be answered until the question and answer portion of our program after today's presentation. All right, let's get started. So, Dr. James Weber founded Prevention Genetics in 2004 with a vision of disease prevention through genetic testing. That vision has helped build a rapidly expanding company that provides comprehensive, low-cost, high-quality clinical DNA testing. Dr. Weber is an internationally acclaimed research scientist and is a major contrib contributor to the Human Genome Project. He has authored and co-authored more than 200 peer-reviewed scientific publications and is responsible for the discovery of short and repeat polymorphisms, microsatellites. Very good. We are very lucky to have him present today on the value of genome sequencing. So, Dr. Weber, please take it away. Thank you, Monica, for that kind introduction. My theme today is that in the great majority of cases, Genome sequencing is the best value genetic test for patients and should be the first and not the last test that is ordered. Now, here is a, a definition of value on the next slide that I particularly like. Value equals quality divided by cost. By this definition, the best value good or service, in our case a genetic test, is one which maximizes quality and minimizes cost. Now, the tests that are particularly expensive are not the best values, and similarly, very low cost tests with poor quality are also not good values. Let's take just a few minutes to review the differences between genome and exome sequencing. On the next slide. So it involves uh, a genome sequencing test, involves a sequencing of the entire genome, all intergenic and deep entronic regions, whereas the exome involves only the coding exons and a little bit of flanking DNA. Consequently, the total sequence generated in a genome uh, clinical test is much greater than an exome test, about 100 billion nucleotides for the genome and only maybe 5 to 10 billion nucleotides for the exome. The library prep, the library is the DNA preparation that is loaded on today's short read sequencers, is relatively easy and inexpensive for the genome, but uh, expensive and difficult, complicated for the exome test. For the exome test, we have to perform a, a, a complex hybridization capture process to get just the exons. For copy number variant detection, copy number variants are large insertions and deletions. The genome is decidedly better than the exome. And as you might imagine, because there's more sequence, uh, computer processing power and data storage is uh, more required for the genome than for the exome. Overall, however, the genome is decidedly uh, superior to the exome test. So why do people perform exomes today? Well, it's all because of the sequencing cost. Um, with high sequencing costs, the exome wins out. But as sequencing costs drop, the genome, uh, the equation starts to tilt in the direction of the genome. Uh, 
And I think today in 2017, we're at a tipping point. I think you'll see many laboratories of the next year or two will be switching from exome to genome sequencing tests. So rather than say genome exome throughout the talk, for the most part, I'll refer to uh, this test as simply a genome sequencing test, looking a little bit ahead to the future, with the understanding that in some cases, I'm actually referring today to an exome test. Well, I've been a proponent of uh, widespread clinical DNA testing for many years. As shown on the next slide, I even published a perspective article in, uh, way back in 1994 in, in Nature Genetics called Know Thy Genome. Uh, but even I have been surprised and impressed by the power of the genome sequencing test. If we go to the next slide, we can see some of the major applications of, of uh, genome sequencing. So diagnosis is still at the top of the list, at least today, but there are many applications beyond diagnosis of this powerful test. So it is the ultimate carrier test for reproductive planning. It, we can, at least for a few disorders today and for more in the future, we can detect susceptibility to late onset disorders. Uh, cancer predisposition is an obvious example. Um, so uh, pharmacogenetics, drug prescription, is certainly, our, I think, from my perspective, it has certainly been overhyped at the beginning. Um, but today I'm convinced that there isn't sufficient evidence for, in at least a, a few cases, for a few drugs, such that the prescription, that is the initial dose or the actual drug itself, can be informed by the patient's genomic sequence. And slowly, as our knowledge and understanding of pharmacogenetics improves, the number of drugs that will be covered by the patient's genomic sequence will improve, will increase. Subclinical Mendelian disease is quite interesting. It's a hot topic. If we can go back, please. Hot topic um, in uh, human genetics research today. And what this means is a, a health problem that is not severe enough to induce the uh, patient to seek out medical care, yet which, uh, if treated, can s substantially improve the patient's health. And I'll give you a nice example of this in just a moment. Um, the family structures can be confirmed by genomic sequencing, a, a simple but important application. And although geoancestry is uh, more often today considered a, a, in the realm of, of recreational genomics rather than clinical testing, it does have some clinical applications and it falls out easily from genomic sequencing. Next slide, please. So here's a summary of an interesting study that appeared uh, late last year in Science from the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania. These researchers sequenced the genomes from about 51,000 patients, and they looked uh, specifically at three hypercholesterolemia genes, LDLR, APOB, and PCSK9. They looked for pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants in these three genes, and out of the 51,000 patients, they found 229. This is about one in 250 patients. Now, of these 229, a little over half had uh, cholesterol levels above 190 milligrams per deciliter or what is commonly considered the, the cutoff for hypercholesterolemia. So they were affected. And uh, by looking in the health records, they found that the relative risk of these 229 patients for premature coronary artery disease was almost four for variants in all three genes. And if you look only at loss of function variants in LDLR, it was over 10. So these patients, these individuals, were at high risk for heart disease, and a little over half were taking statins. The authors concluded that genome sequencing could identify patients who could benefit from uh, treatment for hypercholesterolemia. Okay, let's go on to uh, a case, please. Um, the first case I'll present today this is a, a simple nuclear family, two unaffected parents who had a son with developmental delay. He was eight years old at the time of diagnosis, mild microcephaly, with autism disorder and also with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. He had no dysmorphic features and there was a mild movement disorder which initially was discounted by the clinicians. Next slide, please. So this boy began his diagnostic odyssey way back in 2009 when he was a little under two years of age. Uh, 
you saw a number of pediatricians, at least one neurologist, and believe it or not, three different clinical geneticists, at least five total genetics uh, visits. And he had many lab tests, all of them negative. So uh, chromosomes, cytogenetics, chromosomal microarray, CMA, which uh, looks for copy number variants, fragile X test, Angelman test, he had an MRI, he had extensive biochemical testing because the clinicians ex suspected a biochemical defect and he had GI work. So a long, uh, very expensive diagnostic odyssey, all together with office visits and the lab tests and the time away from work for the parents to bring the child in, uh, tens of thousands of dollars of cost. So we performed the prevention genetics genome sequencing on this patient and the results are shown in the next slide. We found a de novo, likely pathogenic, frame shift variant in the Fox G1 gene. By both next gen and confirmatory Sanger sequencing, this variant appeared to be a mosaic. That is, it probably occurred early in the embryonic development of this boy, and it was apparently present in only a fraction of his nucleated blood cells. What do we know about Fox G1 pathogenic variants? Well, they cause an atypical Rett syndrome. Uh, almost all, all the cases, that is, reported in the literature were de novo, mostly female, and this is a very serious disorder. So um, most of the patients aren't able to walk. They have limited or absent speech, seizures, stereotypic hand motions, microcephaly, poor eye contract. So uh, this boy, although he was clearly affected, was not anywhere near as well as most Fox G1 patients, and it would have been virtually impossible without a genome sequencing test for the clinicians to reach the correct diagnosis. Also, of course, if the uh, genomic sequencing had been performed when the child was first brought in for health care, then the expensive diagnostic odyssey could have been avoided. Next slide, please. So I looked carefully for results on diagnostic odysseys and genetic odysseys in the literature, and there's really not too much, but I present here on this slide and the next one results of three studies that I did find. Perhaps the best one is from Duke, uh, 2012-13, 461 patients referred to genetics clinics. Uh, a little under half received a, a diagnosis, and there are shown on the slide the average lab costs. So over $3,000 for diagnosed patients, almost $5,000 for undiagnosed patients, and a whopping over $25,000 for patients diagnosed after the first office visit. The next study was a patient survey a little older uh, from Europe, many countries, different countries in Europe, uh, completed by a rare disease organization. They looked at only eight specific genetic disorders rather than all. Uh, included were cystic fibrosis and Marfan disease and Fragile X and a number of others. They reported that a quarter of these patients, these 6,000 patients, reported diagnostic odysseys of 5 to 30 years, very long, and 40% of the patients reported receiving the incorrect initial diagnosis, and of these, one in six had a surgical treatment based on the incorrect diagnosis. Ouch. Next slide, please. Here is the results of one other uh, survey uh, reported in uh, uh, this paper in 2013 uh, regarding the average duration of genetic diagnostic odysseys, uh, a little over five and a half years in the UK and a little over seven and a half years in the United States. So can we draw quantitative conclusions from these limited studies? I don't think so. But can we draw qualitative conclusions? I think the answer is yes. And those are that uh, many patients with presumed heritable disorders uh, never receive a diagnosis. At least a few receive incorrect diagnoses. And diagnostic odysseys are often uh, quite expensive and lengthy. Now, the uh, statement on the next slide is one that's pretty obvious and certainly well known to all providers. So for nearly all health problems, an early and accurate diagnosis is best for the patients. It turns out that uh, if you look carefully at Mendelian diseases, all the, the enormous number of Mendelian disorders, you find that um, in many cases, perhaps even the majority of cases, there are at least some treatments or disease management that can be undertaken that if uh, they can't completely cure the disorder or prevent the disease, uh, 
can at least ameliorate the disease. So the severity may be reduced, the onset may be delayed, progression may be stalled, maybe some of the worst clinical feature, uh, features can be avoided. And we have uh, looked carefully at about a dozen of these disorders and have produced what we call prevention articles. They're listed there on, at that link on our website. Uh, but that list is by no means comprehensive, and there are many, many other Mendelian diseases for which some preventive measures, some uh, effective treatments are possible. So for this reason in particular, we want to arrive at an accurate diagnosis, diagnosis as early as possible. On the next slide are shown some nice data also about the importance of early diagnosis for seizure disorders, at least some disorders. And these are data that were uh, uh, put together for me by one of our geneticists at PG, uh, Lee Fan. So you can see for the seizures disorders caused by pathogenic variants in the various genes listed on the left, that the uh, drugs used to control these seizures are quite different. So clearly, uh, for optimal treatments, it's important to identify the correct gene. And if you look at the last row on this slide for the SCN1, SCN1A gene, you see that there are even some drugs that are harmful for these patients and should be avoided. So again, uh, getting the diagnosis correct and early is, is really important. Uh, another important uh, advantage of genomic sequencing is that it provides a big picture. And to help you understand this concept, I'm going to tell you now uh, an old Indian folk tale. Many of you have heard some version of this tale before. So there were some uh, men blind from birth in a small village in India. Uh, these men, to pass the time, liked to uh, talk and argue among themselves. And one of their favorite topics for conversation was this fantastic animal, the elephant. There were no elephants in their village. Well, one day, as a special treat, they were led to the uh, palace grounds of the Raja. And on the palace grounds, of course, were elephants. One of the blind men touched the elephant's trunk and said, an elephant is like a great snake. Another touched the elephant's ear and said, no, you've got it all wrong. An elephant is like a large fan. A third touched one of the elephants. Said, an elephant is just a large cow. And so they argued all the way home and for many days, their weeks thereafter. So what were the blind men missing? They were missing the big picture. They each had experienced a small part of the elephant, but not the complete animal. And so it is with, often with genetic testing. When we perform only single gene sequencing or a small panel, we don't get the big picture and we can be misled. So this is illustrated uh, by the next case on the next slide. So another nuclear family, uh, healthy parents, three different pregnancies, one in 2010, healthy boy born in 2012, and another uh, problem pregnancy in 2016. Both fetuses had uh, significant uh, health problems or abnormalities. Uh, these on the left are shown the clinical features of fetus number one. There's growth retardation, some brain uh, disorders, uh, polydactyly, kidney problems, and based on these clinical features, the clinicians uh, suspected acrocolosal syndrome. At that time in 2010, the gene for this uh, syndrome was not identified, but it was uh, soon thereafter identified as the KIF7 gene. The only genetic test performed on the first fetus was a chromosome analysis, which was normal. The clinical features of the second fetus are shown on the next slide. They were similar to fetus number one, but not identical. Again, there was growth retardation, um, problems with the brain. There was a septal defect in the heart detected by fetal echocardiogram, um, possibly some uh, dysmorphology. And fetus number two had a more extensive genetic workup. So normal chromosomes, normal CMA test. The KIF7 gene was sequenced at genetics. This was negative. And then because the clinical features suggested a recessive ciliopathy, we sequenced at PG a 28 gene Joe Bear panel. And the only thing we found was an uncertain heterozygous variant in the CC2D2A gene. Based upon this finding, a test for copy number variants in this gene was ordered to try to detect uh, a deletion, say, and the, uh, for the second allele for this recessive disease in that gene. But that was also negative. 
So we performed the genome sequencing, and the results are shown on the next slide. We performed it on fetus number two. We found, to I guess everybody's surprise, uh, two clear pathogenic variants in the DHCR7 gene, a nonsense variant and a splicing variant. Um, they were in trans phase. One parent carried each variant. Both variants are clearly documented to be pathogenic, and both variants were present in both affected fetuses. So what do we know about variants, pathogenic variants in this gene? Well, in the homozygous or compound heterozygous state, they cause smith lemme opitz syndrome. Uh, this gene encodes the last enzyme, which uh, catalyzes the step in cholesterol biosynthesis. So the hallmark clinical feature is hypocholesterolemia, and there are other clinical features as well. The, by the clinical features and uh, by uh, the, some of the genetic tests, even expert clinicians were misled. They went down a dead end. They didn't have the big picture, but uh, the genomic sequencing clearly revealed the uh, very likely the cause of the health problems in both fetuses. I'd also point out that, again, um, this uh, test, the genomic sequencing test, could have avoided a, a shorter but still a significant diagnostic odyssey in this family. If, uh, for example, the family had had the genomic sequencing performed in the first fetus, then they could better have planned subsequent pregnancies. And if we turn the clock back even further, if they had each known before even marrying that they were carriers for pathogenic variants in DHCR7, um, they could, again, have better planned reproduction and perhaps even would have decided not to, not to marry but to find different partners. Another importance of getting the big picture from uh, genome sequencing is that, uh, and this has been reported by a few groups now, in that in patients that are, are diagnosed through genomic sequencing, in about 5% of the cases, there are actually two different Mendelian disorders in the patients. And so if we sequence a, say, small gene panel, and even if we find a pathogenic variant or two pathogenic variants, we would always miss the second disorder without the genomic sequencing test. Now, a lot of advances in healthcare are given labels such as revolutionary or disruptive or game-changing, uh, but I'm going to try to avoid that today. Genome sequencing is indeed a powerful test, which I think has the potential to substantially improve healthcare, but it has also substantial limitations. And some of the major ones are shown on the next slide. So first, uh, through genomic sequencing, we reach a diagnosis, at least a clear diagnosis, in only about a third of cases today. In roughly another third of the cases, we find some sequence variants we think could be related to the uh, patient's health problem, but we're not certain, so these are indeterminate. And in the remaining roughly one-third of cases, the tests are clearly negative. We find nothing that we, we think could be connected to the patient's health problem. There are also many uncertain variants that are generated uh, through um, genome sequencing, and I'll give you some numbers. Um, but many people have pointed out that genomic sequencing of patients' DNA has raced far ahead of our ability to interpret the sequences. Interpretation is slowly improving, but right now it's limited. And finally, even with genomic sequencing, coverage is incomplete. We still have trouble, for example, with GC-rich exons and Pyrologous genes are an enormous headache. So pyrologous genes are those that have at least a second, in some cases more than one, additional copies at a different chromosomal locus in the genome with a high degree of sequence similarity. These are one of the greatest uh, problems in clinical DNA testing today. They're very complex. I don't think, uh, my hunch at least, is that no laboratory, no clinical lab does a perfect job of sequencing these genes, and I think, unfortunately, many jobs do a poor job of tackling these genes. So on the next slide are shown some results from actually exome sequencing, in this case, from prevention genetics. And these are the average numbers of variants in the five uh, American College of Medical Genetics interpretation categories. So uh, the average patient has two pathogenic variants, range we've seen so far in patients zero to four, two likely pathogenic variants, and uh, a lo much larger number, 75 uncertain variants with, again, a wide range. So the uncertain sequence variants, at least by our interpretation rules and guidelines at PG, 
dwarf the pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants. There's a roughly equal number of likely benign variants found and many, many uh, common benign variants, about 25,000. Are we still okay? Okay. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a, a cartoon which describes these paralogous genes or parts of genes. So um, the uh, sequence similarity can be intragenic, number one, can be between of two functional genes, number two, can between, be between a functional gene and a pseudogene, that's a gene that looks like a, a gene but apparently is biologically dysfunctional, and even between an exon in, in a functional gene and a non-coding region. In addition to this complexity, the sequence similarity can be restricted to exons or can uh, continue on into introns and intergenic regions. Next slide, please. At Prevention Genetics, we have worked hard over the last year or so uh, using a number of bioinformatics approaches to uh, make lists of uh, genes with, uh, that, that have these, uh, these copy number problems out of the total number today of about 4,000 clinically relevant genes. And we've been pretty conservative in our labeling, but we found actually about 13% uh, of these 4,000 genes that we think have uh, sequence similarity issues. We've split them up into two lists, a red list and a yellow list. The red lists are genes that we're not sure we can sequence at all accurately. The yellow list are genes for which we developed uh, some assay, usually it's a Sanger sequencing assay, where we've done careful validation and we are convinced that we can get accurate sequence. But that doesn't mean that we can get, can get accurate sequence from the next gen um, genome sequencing test. Now, many of these, for many of these genes, the, um, the sequence similarity is confined only to a part of the gene. So if you look at total exons in clinically relevant genes, about 54,000, a much smaller fraction, about 4% total, are in the red and the yellow list. So for some of these prologous genes, we can, we think at least, we can sequence um, at least much of the gene effectively using next gen. It's only part of the gene that's problematic. Well, another uh, common uh, concern people have about genome sequencing is that uh, diagnoses uh, will be and problems will be identified for which there is no good treatment. And many say that uh, people shouldn't uh, have such tests uh, because of the lack of treatment. But I've, I've never agreed with that uh, philosophy. Uh, my philo personal philosophy is that genetic knowledge is always better than genetic ignorance and perhaps the following cartoon will help you understand my position. So next slide, please. This tiger has not had his genome sequenced and he's about to get clobbered by a health problem and he doesn't have a clue. Now in the next caption, next slide, we see that this guy has had his genomic sequence now. He knows the healthcare problem is coming and he can fight back. Next slide. So there are all kinds of ways that patients and their families can fight back. This is true even in cases for which there is no treatment. So in many cases, the disease treatment and management, as I mentioned earlier, can be optimized. Sometimes the patients can go to special clinics and experts who uh, have studied these rare diseases for, for years and can provide optimal treatment. In some cases, we can prevent the disease at least partly, some, in rare cases, even entirely. Uh, patients and their families can always plan. They can plan financially. They can plan their lives. They can plan reproduction. And uh, patients and their families can join patient support groups. So the mother of that child with developmental disorder in the first case has joined a uh, alternative Rett syndrome support group. She's fighting back. And finally, the patients and their families can facilitate and encourage research. They can participate in research studies. They can raise money for research. They can even lobby Congress for more tax dollars for research. So there are always uh, ways in which they can fight back. 
There is never nothing that can be done. And um, I've known in my uh, lifetime uh, many people with, with severe genetic handicaps who have accomplished quite amazing things. Uh, these individuals are my heroes. I have tremendous admiration and respect for such for these individuals. Okay, let's look now a little bit at the costs of genomic sequencing. So if you go to the Prevention Genetics website, you'll see that the cost of a, of a quality genome sequencing test is listed as $2,100. With financial volume, I would reduce this cost to $2,000. So that's the, the price I'm going to use for a, a quality genome sequencing test today. Now, if we compare this cost, this $2,000, to the average lifetime health care costs for a person in America, you might guess that, uh, well, $2,000 is a lot of money. So maybe it's 20% of total lifetime health care costs, or perhaps 10% or 5%. Next slide, please. No, it's actually only one quarter of 1% of average lifetime health care costs in the U.S., about $800,000. So one four hundredth of lifetime health care costs. Now remember that a person's genome sequence doesn't change during their lifetime. So a genomic sequencing test performed on a one-week-old infant is perfectly valid and useful to that person when he or she is 95 years old. And so it only is a test that only has to be performed once in a patient's lifetime. Now, we probably want to add in some other costs like uh, counseling costs and maybe uh, some targeted testing, maybe reinterpretation of the genomic sequence. But even at a half a percent or one percent, uh, I think genomic sequencing is a tremendous value given the power of this test. Now, let's go to the next slide and compare genomic sequencing to, uh, in this case, a popular breast cancer test. So sequencing of the BRCA1 in genes. Uh, one and two genes today might cost somewhere in the range of $800, $400 per gene. But uh, to me, that is a ridiculously bad uh, bargain or value compared to genomic sequencing because you get the breast cancer genes and 4,000 others for $2,000, just a little uh, over two times, and uh, 50 cents per gene. Next slide, please. Carrier testing is also very popular in the U.S. At least a million people, maybe it's two or three million by now, have undergone such carrier testing for reproductive purposes. Uh, if we look at one of the most popular current such tests, sequencing of 176 genes, price of about $900. We learned by comparing the uh, pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants found in genome sequencing tests at Prevention Genetics to these 176 genes, and we found that less than one-fifth, 18% of those pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants that were detected by genomic sequencing were found through this carrier test. So you pay half the price of a genomic sequencing test, and you get only uh, one-fifth the information. Again, not a particularly good value. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, people initially might think that um, genomic tests from different laboratories are all the same, but actually when you look at them carefully, you find that they are, are quite different. So here are some of the ways in which they differ. They differ in terms of coverage, um, and especially in terms of coverage of paralogous genes. Um, interpretation of sequence variants is quite different between different labs. There are already um, inexpensive automated approaches for interpreting genome sequences, but um, today at least, my opinion and those of many, many others, are that uh, automated interpretation is not even close to um, the quality of interpretation by manually by experts. Um, labs differ in their storage of the sequences and in reinterpretation. I'll talk about this in just a minute. And then there are a host of special features that differ among laboratories. Next slide, please. So here are some of these special features. So um, all of these features may or may not be offered in your genome sequencing test. You can see detection of aneuploidies and trisomy, detection of copy number variants for, for again, large insertions and deletions. Um, a couple of things related to um, heterozygosity of variants along the chromosomes. Pharmacogenetic testing may or may not be present, mitochondrial DNA sequencing, HLA typing, and even testing for repeat expansion disorders. 
So all genomic sequencing tests are not the same. Um, you want to have quality tests to obtain the best value. Next slide, please. So um, we want to reinterpret the genomic sequencing test. This is really important because interpretation is improving steadily and also because new gene disease genes are constantly being identified through research. So um, I would say that uh, probably the genomic sequence should be reinterpreted maybe every three to five years throughout a patient's lifetime. Now, there are two critical types of files from the genomic sequence, computer files that we need to retain, or at least would be ideal to retain. One is simply a list of the sequence variants. These are typically called the VCF files, and they're relatively small. For a genome sequencing test now, they're about 150 megabytes, and uh, storage of those files, and pretty much everyone agrees they should be retained, is, is just pennies per year per patient, so not a big deal. But the raw sequence data files, the FASTQ files, are much larger, even when compressed, they're about 50 gigabytes per patient. And today, it costs about $3 per year to store these sequences. So this is, over a patient's lifetime, quite a substantial cost. Now, I still am a proponent of saving these uh, FASTQ files, and we do this at Prevention Genetics. Because not only is the interpretation improving, but the analysis pipelines for analysis of the raw sequence data are also improving. So when we would do an interpretation in, say, three or five years' time, we'd want to reanalyze the raw sequences and then reinterpret the variants that were found. So I, I strongly support, uh, personally, retention of these files, even though there is some cost involved. Okay, so um, let's go to the next slide, please, and to my last case today. So there are a number of laboratories today that are beginning to offer genome sequencing tests, or at least to market these tests, uh, directly to consumers. Usually a physician is still involved in the ordering of the test, but it's still marketing directly to the consumers. So here's a lady who sees uh, genome sequencing tests on, on the shelf, and it's on sale, and she has a coupon. Uh, but the point of this last test, uh, case is that um, price is not the only important factor in genome sequencing. Next slide, please. So in my third case, again, a simple nuclear family, um, uh, parents and two children, a little boy, a little less than a year old, and a three-year-old daughter. So here's the clinical history. A mom has had a problem for some time of abdominal pain. Uh, so she has some type of digestive problem, but she was never admitted to the hospital for this pain. She is convinced that her little baby boy has the same problem because he spits up a lot, and she doesn't think her daughter is affected. So she went out and on her own got her genome sequenced. She found a, a low-cost genome sequencing test, and when she received the report back in the laboratory, it showed that she had a pathogenic sequence variant in her PRSS1 gene, and it was a missense variant, alanine 16 to valine. We know that this variant is indeed, uh, from the literature, is indeed pathogenic, and it's involved, although it's incompletely penetrant, in uh, uh, dominant chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis is characterized by painful inflammation of the pancreas. Um, it, it, it initially is, it has periodic episodes of this uh, abdominal pain. Uh, in many patients, it leads to chronic pain. And it's severe, sometimes accompanied by vomiting, and often, although not always, the patients are admitted to hospitals. So it's a pretty s a severe disorder. The uh, treatment of last resort for these patients is pancreatectomy, a very uh, obviously significant step and one that would, should never be undertaken lightly. So um, fortunately, this woman's physician uh, sent her DNA to prevention genetics, her, her DNA and also the DNA for her two children uh, for confirmatory Sanger sequencing. Next slide, please. And when we uh, sequenced uh, the DNA from these three individuals, uh, shown in the right panel here, uh, we could not find the variant. There was just one variant at each position. 
corresponding to uh, this alanine 16 valine substitution. And on the left is shown a past positive uh, patient from prevention genetics, and we could clearly detect this variant in the heterozygous state. So what gives? Next slide, please. Well, it turns out that PRSS1 is a paralogous gene. It has uh, close copies, two others at least, in the genome, PRSS2 and 3. And this slide shows an alignment of the th sequences, at least part of the sequences from the three genes. That segment in the box is the C to Z transition that was reported in this patient. And uh, what we're convinced now happened is that, by mistake, the laboratory was detecting sequences from PRSS3, not the, the gene that's involved in chronic pancreatitis, PRSS1, and that, that substitution was actually a fact. So the lesson here is that um, the lowest price tests are not always the best value. Well, um, I'm sure that for all or nearly all of you, uh, my talk today has not been the first talk you've ever heard on genomic sequencing, and I guarantee you it won't be the last. But I hope that um, today uh, I've uh, helped at least a little to sway you to be more favorably disposed towards genomic sequencing. To recap, last slide, please. So clinical genomic sequencing provides, in my opinion, the best value to patients because, first, it helps to avoid the high costs of diagnostic odysseys. Second, it assists in reaching accurate diagnosis early to provide the best opportunity for, for prevention and disease management. Third, it gives the big picture, provides not just sequence information for a few genes, but rather all, all genes. Next, it is improving rapidly in quality. Literally weekly, the genomic sequencing tests are getting a little bit better. And prices and turnaround times for these tests are steadily dropping. And finally, it's a test which fits all patients and all disorders. So many single gene and small panel tests can and often are inappropriately ordered, but it's impossible to uh, misorder a genome sequencing test because, again, it fits all patients and all disorders. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you, Dr. Weber. And I think we've got some questions coming in from our audience. And I just, um, I'll go ahead and start with some that I see on my screen, Dr. Weber. So um, what level of mosaicism is reliably detectable on the exome or genome sequencing at prevention genetics? Well, we're pretty conservative uh, with our calls of mosaicism. I think we, I believe on our, our test descriptions, we claim that we can only detect um, mosaicism that's present in 50% or more of the nucleated cells from which we extract DNA. But in uh, practice, we probably can go down to perhaps 20% mosaicism, but not today, at least not at PG, could we go down, I think, to 10 or 5%, say. Okay, and um, the patient with the FOXG1 mutation, um, I believe that was from blood. Is that correct? Was the source blood? And what level of mutation was seen in that, or mosaicism was seen in that patient? I don't remember the exact level, but it was significant. So um, there was a paper that just very recently, last few weeks, appeared in Nature, a research paper in which they looked at mosaicism of variants in patients' blood. And they concluded that uh, only um, somatic mutations which occurred in the first few cell divisions would likely be present in a significant fraction of blood cells. So we think, as I mentioned before, that the mutation probably occurred very early in embryogenesis in this boy. And again, I don't know the exact level of mosaicism, but I think it was uh, quite substantial, probably at least 25%. Okay, great. Thanks for that follow-up. We've got one other question um, coming in. Um, Dr. Weber, when providers are comparing exome tests on the market, what do you suggest are the most important quality comparisons to consider when they're looking at, at different tests in different labs? 
Well, I think uh, all of the, um, the factors I, I listed on my slide a few slides ago are important. Um, I think certainly coverage is important, um, whether it's a genome or an exome test and the depth of, of sequence coverage. Um, I think the way the uh, labs handle prologous genes is very important. We don't want to be too aggressive uh, or too uh, conservative in our uh, tackling of these prologous genes. And the interpretation is important, but then I think the, all of these features are really important. So if you're buying an automobile, clearly you, you, you're looking for all the features that are present in the car, and uh, uh, you expect more features in a more expensive test. And, and so uh, to, to maximize quality, we want to test with lots of features, with high quality, and uh, relatively low, low price. Perfect. So I have a few questions from the... Um, internet audience and the room. Uh, one is related to the number of paralogous genes that you listed, um, around 4,000. Is that the total number across the genome, or is that only for dis known disease-causing genes? Okay, so let me clarify. Um, we have identified what we think are the clinically relevant genes, relevant for Mendelian disease today in the genome. So about 20,000 total genes in the genome, and we think about 4,000 today are clinically relevant. That number is slowly growing. Of these 4,000, uh, we have identified about 500 that we think have these uh, copy numbers, these sequence similarity issues. Now, our approach is quite conservative. And it's probably true that many of these 500 genes can actually be accurately sequenced using genome sequencing. But we are literally looking at these uh, 500 genes on a case-by-case -case basis, and we want to be convinced that we can accurately sequence them before we will report variants in these genes. Great. Thank you for the clarification. Um, there's another question from... Uh, one of our state providers. How many cases have you found where panel or exome, sync, exome testing was negative, but turned out to have mutations identified by the whole genome approach? Are there specific examples or types of clinical conditions where that would be more likely, where you should go straight to the genome? <laughs> I don't know exactly how many such cases we have uh, performed at PG or found at PG. I have given during the talk a couple of clear examples where genome sequencing would actually be the best first test. My strong personal opinion is that in virtually all cases, and that's the theme of my talk, is that we should go immediately to the genome sequencing test. If we start with uh, tests that are inexpensive, maybe a single gene test, maybe a CMA test. We're actually just beginning this diagnostic odyssey, and my opinion is that in the long run, although sure, you might hit on the, the patient's, the cause of the patient's health problems with the first gene in some cases, but overall, the patients will be much farther ahead through the genome sequencing than through a single gene or small panel test. I see. So related to that um, philosophy, I think, you know, our audience here definitely sees the value in genome sequencing and exome sequencing um, as the best value. However, you know, we struggle with the logistic issues of um, coverage and, and dealing with preauthorization and insurance. So what is your um, thoughts or your action that Prevention Genetics is doing to currently address the, that issue and helping educate insurance companies to um, improve coverage? I think that's an excellent question, and I agree completely that uh, insurance companies are a limitation today in ordering uh, genome sequencing tests. What can we do? I think just what PLUGS is doing today. We need to uh, all keep working on the insurance companies and trying to uh, encourage them to cover these tests. I think uh, the best way to approach the insurance companies is to work on the basis of cost. So give them examples of very expensive diagnostic odysseys, uh, 
and show them how a $2,000 genome sequencing test is actually the, the lowest cost option for the patient and will we'll, uh, hold down their costs as much as possible. Great. I think we can agree with that approach here. Um, what is, this, this is one, we've got a couple more questions left and then I'll, I'll hand it back over to Monica to wrap up. What is your policy at prevention on secondary findings? Is it opt-in or opt-out? Do you report medically actionable um, secondary findings only or all of them? And what other considerations do you, you, do you take into account? Another really good question. So on our test requisition forms for uh, genomic sequencing, we provide the uh, patients with a number of options. Um, we allow them to opt out of the ACMG 59 genes. We allow them to opt in for uh, uh, secondary findings, that is, diagnosis uh, uh, And we also allow them to opt in to carrier testing. And very shortly, we will allow the patients to opt in for pharmacogenetic testing. Um, obviously, this is getting pretty complicated, and at uh, some point, probably we'll want to reduce the number of options just to simplify the ordering form. Uh, but um, today, that's where we stand. Um, I find it may be related to your question that, that the most difficult part of uh, performing the genome sequencing tests is to uh, decide what to include on the reports. So um, we find, as I showed before, many uncertain variants, variants of uncertain clinical significance. Many of these could possibly be connected to the health problem, but to report them all would just be to overwhelm the patient and the clinicians, and so we, we can't do that. But on the other hand, if we report too few variants, then we might not report uh, one which is really important in the patient's health. So. Uh, that's a really tough part today in generating these uh, genome sequencing reports. Great. I think we need, um, we just have one final question uh, regarding a little more clarity around the difference um, in approach, testing approach between genome sequencing and exome sequencing. Do you have uh, thoughts on if there's any situation where an exome sequencing, for example, for a metabolic or single gene disorder would be the more appropriate first-line approach? Are you considering the entire elephant to be both genome and exome or genome only? I'm sorry, would you repeat that last part, please? Using your elephant metaphor, does the, ele does the exome count as seeing the whole picture? No, exome is not really a whole. Uh, clearly, we, we don't know of a lot of pathogenic variants that are in deep intronic regions or between genes, but we know of some, and undoubtedly there are others that await discovery. But I think um, there are other big advantages of genome sequencing. Uh, detection of CNVs is certainly one. Uh, and so I think uh, given that if we can, if the sequencing costs drop low enough so that a, a, an exome and a genome are about the same price, then I would, I would always go for genome. Um, the only maybe other limitation I'd say with genome today is that because of sequencing costs, maybe we can only do 30-fold coverage, and ideally we'd want to do more. So the depth of coverage today might be higher for an exome test. Great. Um, I think that covers most of the questions uh, from online and here from the Seattle group. Monica, would you like to um, say the final announcements? Thank you, Dr. Dickerson. I, I will um, go ahead and end. Thank you, Dr. Weber, for this fascinating talk. I think we had um, great questions and great um, great conversation. So I want to remind all the listeners that our next webinar will be on Tuesday, May 16th, and that will be titled Lab Talk, a discussion on rapid exome and the impact on patient care. Um, and the presenters are Dr. Ben Solomon from GeneDx, and there'll be more information posted soon about that webinar.
Also a reminder, um, our Plug Summit is coming up in June. That will be held June 15th through 16th in Seattle. This is our third annual summit um, entitled Laboratory Stewardship, Engaging Insurance, Informatics, and Clinical Experts to Improve Patient Care. And um, there, we will be surely discussing those insurance questions and coverage of genetic testing. Always a great time. So we hope to see you there. Um, you can visit our website um, for more information and registration. All right. Um, with that, I hope you all have a great afternoon, and we will be signing off. Until next time.